Hello everyone and welcome back once again to New Egg TV. My name is Paul. Today we have a very special guest. This is JJ. How you doing, JJ? I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking me. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, JJ is from ASUS, as you all probably know. JJ is a little under the weather today, so a uh, big thank you. Let's see, case in point right there. Big thanks to JJ for coming out today. Um, if you're thankful for JJ coming out here, hit the like button down there. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, but we're here to talk about a new motherboard yeah. for, let's call it, an old chipset. Sure. Um, the X79 chipset uh, has been out for about two years now. It is the enthusiast platform from Intel. Uh, currently, it's available uh, with Sandy Bridge E chips, which have also been out for quite some time. Excellent for workstations, for anything you need multi-threaded applications for, if you need a ton of PCI Express lanes. But what is out now, also for X79 chipset and the Socket 2011 platform, is Ivy Bridge E. So uh, updated uh, processors based on the newer uh, microarchitecture micro from Intel. Correct. Um, and uh, you guys have come out with the X79 Deluxe, which we have a sample of right here. So uh, let's let's start from the basics. Uh, Sandy Bridge versus Ivy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E versus Ivy Bridge E. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you sort of classify the differences between the two? Well, um, you know, like you noted, actually, uh, Sandy Bridge is a fantastic platform for somebody that's looking for pretty much the highest end in terms of the PCI Express lanes, uh, memory bandwidth, memory density configurations, and overall, uh, uh, you know, enthusiast level performance and expansion. Um, one important note, though, is you mentioned content creation, and it can actually, even gamers, though, can actually benefit from Sandy Bridge E and mm -hmm. now even Ivy Bridge E. Um, what's sometimes not clearly understood is that you have aspects of frame latency and actually um, dependency on uh, complex uh, AI intelligence mm. as well as uh, load balancing that occurs in large open world environments where between different types of CPU platforms, even when compared to, let's say, Ivy Bridge or Haswell-based platforms, Sandy Bridge can actually provide a significantly better latency-based experience. Um, so even gamers running high resolutions and multi-monitor configurations, uh, even if you look at the entire perspective of performance on how your system is responsive mm -hmm. and how it's running can actually pr uh, get a benefit. But in terms of your question for Sandy Bridge versus is Ivy Bridge E. Uh, there's a healthy IPC increase that, you know, of course, depending on the application, could be anywhere between, you know, 10 to 20 percent. Okay. Uh, overclocking is going to be comfortably within the same margin, uh, which is nice because, of course, with the increase in IPC, if you're keeping the same nominal clocks, that's nice to know that essentially you can overclock to the same um, kind of target zones, uh, which is going to probably be somewhere between about 4.6 to about 4.8 gigahertz. Okay. Uh, the memory controller, though, is quite a bit more robust. Uh, so uh, from previous generation, where generally, you know, uh, only outstanding boards and outstanding CPUs, we're generally going to be looking past 2133. On this platform, you're generally able to look at 2133, even 2400. Uh, we've done validation actually up to 20, 2800 speeds on uh, this generation of X79 and Ivy Bridge E. Uh, so overall, you're pretty much getting a benefit to all the things that you would expect in terms of uh, frequency, uh, overall IPC, uh, you have the native PCI Express Gen 3 initialization support, and you mm -hmm. keep all the things that were classically true compared uh, to X79 to the mainstream chipsets as far as more cores, more cache, more express lines. All right, so uh, there's uh, some definitely some excellent uh, reasons why you folks out there might be interested in Ivy Bridge E as well as the X79 platform. Now, again, since we're talking about a slightly older chipset, and mm -hmm. since uh, Sandy Bridge E and X79 came out, we've had uh, Ivy Bridge come out on the mainstream platform. Yes. We've also had Haswell come out. Um, and those have introduced some newer technologies um, which aren't necessarily inherent to the X79 chipset. So talking more specifically about the X79 Deluxe board right here, uh, what have you guys done to sort of bring this board up to sort of that same level of functionality and inter interoperability um, that we have, say, on the Haswell platform? We pretty much looked at each uh, at each one of the controller implementations and each one of the add-in items, and we tried to pretty much make that a parity experience to what you would have on current generation motherboards. Okay. Uh, so, you know, first off, of course, in our previous generation Deluxe, we had wireless and Bluetooth support, but it was only two 2.4 gigahertz in Bluetooth 3.0. Mm -hmm. For this generation, we've updated it to the latest generation, 811AC 2x2 with Bluetooth 4.0. So you get the fastest wireless specification uh, that's available out there with the latest Bluetooth standard built on board. And just a quick point for me to make, I really like how you guys constantly go with the uh, the kind of riser card right here, mm -hmm. because again, if you're going with this platform, chances are you're going for it because you like the I.O. options. Correct. And simply by having that there, you just leave yourself more space here for other add-on cards that, that is, you might need. That so. is a great point. It is more complicated to be able to integrate it into the back I.O., but if you're going to promote a board as being 3-way capable, mm -hmm. uh, but you're quote-unquote including a wireless card, you've now 
actually eliminated the ability to run a three-way configuration. Very true. So you can actually run that, maintain that. Plus, uh, you know, uh, one of the nice things in the vertical solution we're using is we're fully shielding the actual module, which helps to minimize any type of interference and maintains better throughput and Very stability. Nice. Now, in terms of the overall VMware assembly and the power topology, you can see, of course, first and foremost, we've got the gold accents, uh, the gold anodization to the heat sink, so it mirrors the current theme that we have for our Z87 series of motherboards. Okay. But more importantly, what's underneath those heat sinks is a brand new power topology design. So we're utilizing our T topology for the DRAM, which is our high performance trace layout design, which allows us to have faster performance uh, for multi dim configurations and higher frequencies. As I noted, um, you know we can generally see consistent uh, overclocking support in uh, 2400 uh, DDR3, and even higher than that. As I've noted, we've done validation actually upwards of 2800. Very nice. And in terms of all the key power components, you're still getting absolute highest quality power components you can get on the market. So. You've got uh, high-grade 5K rated capacitors uh, spread out throughout the entire motherboard. You've got new high-performance inductors or chokes uh, that are directly underneath here. And you've got uh, new uh, high-performance MOSFET and drivers that are integrated in here. So in terms of the overall power output capability, uh, you can be solid in terms of it being solid, efficient, reliable, and providing everything you need for uh, a solid overclocking experience. So Excellent. no worries in that respect. Now, compared to the previous generation, uh, we also went in and we added a, a significantly improved storage array section. So our previous Deluxe board only had eight serial ATA ports. Uh, for this generation, we've moved on over to 12 <laughs> total serial ATA ports. So, uh, <laughs> excuse me, these black ones right here are provided directly by the actual uh, the integrated storage array. Okay. And that's going to be SATA 6G with four 3G ports. We then have an AS Media 1061 supplemental controller, which provides us two SATA 6G ports. And then we have a Marvell 9230 controller, uh, which is actually supporting our SSD caching 2 technology. Okay. The benefit that that controller offers is that it's a by 2 PCI Express link versus a by 1, so you have more throughput available oh, to nice. that controller as a whole. Um, but it also has um, more functionality so that for users that are looking for improving complex storage array configurations, you can go ahead and attach a mechanical hard drive, so let's say like a two terabyte or three or four terabyte drive, mm -hmm. and you can take up to three SSDs and aggregate the performance on that singular volume so you can keep improving the performance of that drive. Nice. Um, this is really nice, especially if you're leveraging this type of platform for where it's intended, which are complex high level workloads. Mm -hmm. uh, so like people that are doing, you know, uncompressed photography, 2K video, 4K video workloads where you need the capacity of a mechanical drive, but you also want to be able to improve upon the performance to be able to have more dynamic and more responsive system. Excellent. So uh, moving on from there, we've of course integrated a number of other kind of uh, newer generation features that we've had, such as uh, in the bottom section of the board. Uh, I know that you're a big fan of the direct key button. I am. Because, uh, of course, all our X79 boards have been updated to support uh, native UEFI, um, uh, excuse me, native UEFIs that are optimized for Windows 7 or Windows 8 in terms of their post and their boot speeds. And with that, you can have a very fast post. Okay. So you can just hit the direct key button, and that can reboot you directly into the operating system, excuse me, directly into the UEFI. We also have a DRCT header, okay. which will allow you to take the uh, lead from your reset cable on the front of your chassis, run that to that lead, and so you could press the reset button and reboot directly into so your system. Two tiny little pins right there, and uh, it's a very handy way to, especially if you're into overclocking or tweaking your system settings, e really easy way to get into the UEFI, you don't have to sit there and spam the delete button. That's Correct. Sort of uh, we maintain, of course, the TPU and EPU switches. Okay. So this is uh, just for a quick hardware-centric based overclock, but we've incorporated a two-stage EPU model so that for users that are looking for a more aggressive overclock than the standard 4.3 gigahertz, they can go ahead and just flip it into the second position and even have a more aggressive overclock okay. with just a simple single uh, flip of the switch. So this switch here is a is three position so on the far left it would just be TPU off and Correct. then you can go with a, sort of the basic overclocking options right here. Mm -hmm. Again it's going to automatically tune, test your, your, your CPU based on the CPU you actually have in there. Uh, do some it's actually a little bit different than that. This okay. uses a fixed base profile, so oh, okay. you know we go through hundreds of different CPUs, and we find a minimal margin that those CPUs can I comfortably see. run okay. at. And so that's what we're going to generally use here. This is for these users that you want to take advantage of the K part or the X part that you bought, but mm -hmm. maybe you don't want aggressive levels of overclocking, so you're just looking for a simple one-touch solution. Okay. Now, speaking to that, before we get to the EPU switch, we do maintain the four-way optimization technology. So the four-way optimization technology that's on this board is... Um, it's the same as that we had on the Z87 series motherboards. Mm -hmm. So this is great because what it means is it can dynamically overclock the system, as you were noting, specific to your CPU, okay. your memory, and your cooling. 
And in our internal analysis, we're generally finding that the results that can be offered, uh, you know, with a decent quality cooler is going to be usually in the target range of about uh, 45 to 46 gigahertz. Very uh, nice. Four point, excuse me, 40, uh, 4.5 to 4.6 gigahertz. And uh, it also incorporates per-core tuning. So the advantage of a per-core tuning model means that we can go ahead and also increase that on, let's say, three and four threads to 47, and okay. then one and two threads to 48. So we're dynamically taking the architecture and allowing it to maximize uh, relative to what's the margin for your CPU quality. And also that's beneficial for different types of workload environments, because some programs that you might run might only be singular threaded in nature, versus other programs that will be able to take more advantage of more threads. Nice, uh, so would you actually be able to say, actively identify different uh, programs that you might use in order to implement uh, the different type of per-core tuning. So, for instance, if you're playing a game and you know the game's not very CPU intensive, you might want to go with a lower overclock versus something like uh, video editing or something like that. Yeah. You might want a higher overclock on all your the cores. The feature is available for that technically within the architecture of the, uh, the the CPU and the motherboard supports that corresponding function. But as of right now, you don't have finalized application support of being able to do that. Now, uh, Intel's working closely with us and they do have uh, an application that's referred to as Intel XTU, okay. which is compatible with this board, uh, which will be offering app to and some other corresponding features that allow you guys as power users to be able to really take advantage of a large amount of the real-time tuning aspects of this CPU and this platform. So it's definitely something you're going to want to continue to look at over time as the software gets more mature and as they finalize some of these more specialized features uh, where on this platform you now have so much real-time adjustment, whether it's for the BCLK, whether it's for the multipliers, or whether it's for even the CPU straps, which in the previous generation you could modify, but they would require full restarts of the system. Very nice. Um, now we still maintain, of course, the EPU. Uh, switch, which doesn't affect performance, it just uh, provides an undervolt to the CPU, allowing you to have a little bit lower power consumption, a little bit lower uh, temperatures under load. Okay. And uh, moving over to, of course, temperatures is, of course, cooling. Uh, we've got a huge amount of fan connectivity on this board, and like our current generation of boards, every single one of these headers is not only 4-pin, uh, but they do leverage our Fan Expert 2 technology. Very nice. So, of course, that means each one of these headers can do 3-pin and 4-pin control, fully adjustable not only from within the UEFI environment, but also within the operating system in our AI Suite 3 system utility. Excellent. So you've got a huge amount of flexibility and tuning that's available to you there. And uh, if you guys want more information on the Fan Expert, we've done a video in the past that you can check out here on Newegg TV to give you some more insight on some of the really cool advantages for Fan Expert. And I think moving along with that, we also have incorporated uh, um, all the new UEFI options okay. that we covered on our Z87 series overview videos. So if you guys are looking for information on, like let's say, like our Quick Note feature, our One Touch XMP enabled option, SATA port renaming, and so much more, I definitely would recommend checking out that video because all those new UEFI features are also present on this board as well. Very nice. And again, that's uh, the Z87 UEFI demo for ASUS that we did. If you guys want to check out that video. So I think wrapping some things up here, of course, a lot of people always ask about the I.O. on a board. Definitely. So if we just quickly touch here on the I.O., we've got pretty much everything you're going to want. You've got four USB 2 ports. Uh, you've got the white USB BIOS flashback port, so that's a great way to go ahead and update or recover the UEFI. Mm -hmm. No CPU, no memory, no graphics card, just the PSU for standby power. You, of course, got two USB 3 ports, two more here and two more here, so that's a total of six, plus the USB 3 onboard header. Uh, these, of course, all support our USB 3 boost technology for improving the performance for flash drives or external SSDs and USB charger plus for quick charging okay. your mobile devices. You've got an Intel latest generation i-series uh, network controller. Uh, you've got uh, two powered eSATA, uh, uh, eSATA 6G based ports. Uh, of course, those four USB 3 ports that we noted on. We then have a secondary NIC. This is a gigabit NIC just like this one. This is uh, powered by a Realtek, the current generation chip. Uh, okay. Of course, the integrated 811AC with Bluetooth. And then, of course, here we've got our analog uh, audio outputs uh, along with, of course, the, the Toslink optical out. Now, this is powered by the latest generation ALC 1150 audio codec and also supports the DTS Ultra 2 PC and DTS Connect software. Very nice. So a uh, very well-rounded board. And uh, if you guys were have been following sort of the the pre-launch stuff for IP Bridgey, and you've been looking at the X79 chipset, and you know there was a little bit of back and forth about whether or not Intel would be bringing in a, a new chipset to bear with the launch of IP Bridgey. They did not, however, as you can see uh, with this board, ASUS has really done all the work to bring the boards up to speed with all the current generation I/O, adding the USB 3, uh, adding the SATA 6G, as well as all the functionality that we've come to expect now that it's been about two years since uh, this platform originally launched. So yeah, it's an awesome board, great feature. With Ivy Bridge E, this thing just 
rocks. It's really fast. It's responsive. Um, the last note that I do want to make is that a lot of people always wonder sometimes what's the difference between our older X79 boards that may support it through a UEFI update versus a brand new board. And the main thing is going to be that the UEFI and the board has been natively designed from the ground up to best optimize and benefit the Ivory Bridge E architecture versus the other way around on our older platforms. Uh, we're going to prioritize interoperability and compatibility and performance for Sandy Bridge E mm -hmm. and patch and compatibility for Ivy Bridge. Uh, this means that you're still going to get great stability, great functionality, and even great overclocking. But there are subtle differences, such as Intel's management engine firmware will be the latest 9.0 revision, uh, along with their Intel option ROMs, which are the latest revisions. So both those are optimally designed for Ivy Bridge E and the latest generation benefits that Intel's worked on. Where on previous generation platforms, those might not necessarily be in place. Now you bring up a good point. Uh, just So just one last thing I wanted to ask more as a, uh, as a question. Um, Asus, you guys have done a great job maintaining support for boards Correct. after they launch, mm -hmm. um, whether it's through UEFI updates or uh, software updates, that sort of thing. Um, so for older X79 boards that have already come out for ASUS, if folks at home are curious if if that is going to be compatible with Ivy Bridgey or how to make it compatible? They will 100% be fully compatible. We've okay. already released full UEFI updates for our entire range, so from everything from a Sabertooth board to a Rampage 4 Formula, Rampage 4 Extreme, or a P9X79 Pro board. They are all receiving Ivy Bridge E uh, UEFI updates, uh, so you will be able to go ahead and patch to have uh, solid functionality and performance and overclocking. Excellent. And then, of course, you also have the option of going with something like this one, which has been brought up to speed uh, with some of the additional functionality that that we've uh, come to know and love over the past year or two. Correct. But that's going to wrap it up for this video. JJ, thank you very much for stopping by today. Thank you for having me. And uh, thanks to all you guys for watching. If you'd like to see more tech videos, check out our new TV YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit that like button again. JJ has uh, stopped by today, even though he is a bit under the weather. So a big thank you to him for that. And uh, we'll see you all next time on Newegg TV.